Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so this talk is going to give kind of a uh, user overview of etcd. Um, if we have time, I can go more into the computer science -y side of how etcd works and that sort of thing. But this will probably primarily be about the applications of etcd and then the um, uh, the basics of how it operates so that uh, you as a system administrator wanting to use etcd um, ha have a good idea of, of the concepts uh, at play. Uh, I'm, I'm the CTO and co-founder of CoreOS. Um, I've been a systems engineer for a long time. I spent uh, time at Rackspace and SUSE and now most, most recently at CoreOS. <coughs> Alright, so etcd is a very um, uh, has a very clever name. Uh, the idea was that we needed to have a place to store configuration for clusters of machines um, that was resilient to individual machine failures. Um, so uh, how it got its name was we wanted to make slash Etsy, the place that we store configuration on a single host distributed over multiple hosts. Um, you notice the extremely clever combination of terms there. Um, so uh, etcd has a few properties um, that are of interest. Um, it's open source software. Uh, it's failure tolerant. So uh, a number of machines within an etcd cluster can fail, and the system continues to operate normally without human intervention. Um, it's durable. Everything that goes uh, into the etcd key store um, gets written to disk uh, in a write ahead log file that can be backed up and restored later. It's watchable, so clients of etcd can get uh, notifications of changes. And it's exposed via an HTTP interface. So etcd is a key value database store, um, but it can be uh, accessed from any programming language that can speak HTTP. Uh, in fact, people have, have written things like master election systems using bash and curl. I wouldn't suggest it, um, but it is absolutely possible. <clears throat> Um, and then the, the other important property is it's runtime reconfigurable. Um, there have been systems like etcd in the past, but one of the primary downfalls of those systems um, is that they uh, uh, didn't have a underlying consensus protocol that allowed for reconfiguration of the members of the cluster without taking a downtime of the, of the database and the cluster itself. Um, and the entire point of this whole darn exercise is to <laughs> make something that doesn't fail in the face of, uh, of machine failures. So it's important that we are able to remove and replace machines without making the cluster go down. Um, the data store API is very straightforward. It's what you'd expect from a key value store. So you can use the get verb in HTTP to get keys out, and you can use the put verb to put keys in, and you use the delete verb to delete keys from the key store. Um, a, a couple of interesting things, though, about the key store is that there's uh, compare and swap, um, or compare and set, and compare and delete. Um, and we'll kind of cover that in a bit. But the basic idea here is that um, with etcd, you're able to safely take, take locks and mutexes um, over uh, in a distributed system. And that's, that's the core tenet, is that I'm able to do something similar to a mutex or a file lock on disk, only it works across uh, a host of machines, and it's a safe operation. All right, so this is how an etcd cluster looks in normal operation. Um, you have, in general, you have five to seven members of the cluster that are actually actively participating in the consensus. Um, you can have more members of the cluster that are uh, not participating in consensus, but the general idea is that you have a stable core. Um, Google has a system similar to this called Google Chubby, and when uh, Google operates their Chubby systems in each of their clusters, they generally uh, allocate five, to six, five machines within the, uh, a few racks that are the Chubby cluster, and those machines are carefully um, managed because, uh, like I said, this, this system is designed for storing really important configuration data. And so what are sort of the applications? Why, what sort of configuration data are we talking about? Um, one of the first reasons that we built um, etcd was we wanted to build a system called Locksmith. And the idea with Locksmith is that CoreOS has an automated um, update system. And we have a few things of how the update system works um, that makes it safe and atomic and has a rollback property. Um, but we wanted to free the system administrator from having to um, manage the rollout of updates across their fleet of machines. So, uh, you can imagine, I think we've all written the for loop 
um, for for sequence one to one hundred, whatever the size of our cluster is, SSH in, app get update, reboot, then log back in, check and make sure it's healthy. Um, we've all done that at some point in our careers. Um, but with Locksmith and with etcd, the idea is that we set a semaphore size. So we say it's safe in my application if two machines reboot at a given time. And Locksmith takes care of actually rebooting the machines as uh, um, as updates are applied to the host. So the update cycle is actually fully automated and it's something that is um, safe because you're relying on a um, consistent locking service to take care of ensuring that the um, machines are safely acquiring locks, releasing locks when they come back from their, from their reboot. Um, so in CoreOS, um, similar to really good hardware, um, like, like Cisco routers and stuff, we have a A and B partition and um, when you're running the A partition of CoreOS, we're atomically updating, or we're updating the B partition in the background, and then we atomically switch uh, over a reboot, and we check the health of the machine across the reboot and roll back to the old version if it's not healthy. <clears throat> so this is good hardware. This isn't how your, uh, your routers at home work, because <laughs> uh, the manufacturer didn't want to spend the extra 15 cents on an additional flash ROM. Um, so essentially the idea is that you, um, you get that update, you reboot, and you're on the next version. Um, and the algorithm that Locksmith takes essentially is, um, I need a reboot, <clears throat> uh, decrement uh, the semaphore that's held in etcd, uh, reboot the host, <clears throat> and then uh, once you come back across the reboot and you're running the new version of CoreOS, unlock uh, the semaphore from etcd. And that's the basic operation. Um, another application for etcd is, uh, uh, scheduling systems. So who's, who's heard of Kubernetes? Few people in the audience. Um, another uh, scheduler is Fleet that we built. Um, there's other schedulers that don't use etcd, such as Mesos. Um, who's, who's worked at Google or worked with any scheduling system in the past, just in general? Okay. Um, so I'll give it just a really fast overview of what a scheduling system looks like. Um, so, like all good computing systems, it begins with you, because uh, computers should be helping humans be better. Um, and you talk to the scheduler API. So imagine that I have an HTTP workload, some type of HTTP server. I tell the scheduler API, I want to have 100 of these running inside my infrastructure. I don't care where these things land. They have these requirements for RAM and CPU and disk, but I want 100 of them running and I want those behind the load balancer. So you describe this in some sort of document um, with Fleet or Kubernetes, it's over an HTTP interface. You describe this in some sort of JSON document and you say, uh, scheduler make this happen now this is really important data right this is how you want your this is how you want your cluster configured um, and so that's why you want to sort an etcd if a single machine fails within your cluster you want the cluster to still be running a hundred of these things and so that's why you want to use a cluster data store like etcd um, to store it um, and there's uh, essentially master elections that are happening too when you make this um, this decision because uh, this, this description of the work that you want to have done goes into the scheduler. And the scheduler essentially is making a master election decision on those zero through 100 um, jobs that you want running in your cluster because it's saying it's going to land on machine A, machine B, machine C. Machine A gets four of the jobs, machine B gets 20 of the jobs, machine C gets et cetera, et cetera. And you need to have an atomic way of saying this is the decision that's been made by the scheduler and this is how the cluster should be configured. All right. Uh, so, right. Essentially, how I've described it, the, um, the, the cluster uh, scheduling workflow is write desired work into etcd. Um, agents on each individual host pick up that work and then the agents report uh, whether that's running or not to etcd using a leader election. Um, there's other applications for services like uh, for etcd. Um, there's a, a HTTP load balancer called Vulkan um, that uses etcd and you, uh, it's being used by a company called Mailgun um, and Mailgun uses it to load balance across all their API servers and uh, it's you can think of it as an alternative to um, something like um, something like ELBs. 
Uh, other things that can be used for etcd are uh, configuration file uh, writeouts. There's a DNS server backed by etcd called SkyDNS. Um, and then also somebody's prototyped out using uh, etcd as uh, a data store for um, Git ref heads. So the, um, the idea there is that you could safely have a globally replicated atomically um, updated Git repository um, that uses etcd to store the refs. So um, you would have essentially a multi-master uh, etcd or multi-master git server um, which is a really interesting use case of this stuff too all right so uh, we're going to go through and explain how a leader election might work using etcd um, and it'll use two features of etcd uh, the first is ttls so the idea that a key can have uh, a time to live of say 600 seconds and then etcd will delete that key and then the idea of an atomic operation so um, i want this i want to set this key only if it's at a particular version or at a particular state um, so uh, <laughs> this is probably I probably should have chosen a better URL scheme but um, you can imagine that you have some type of cluster ID of 6EA and then you have a machine ID of F1D um, and you're wanting to put in and register the uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the URL of this host um, into the cluster. And so you create a key entry, and this key entry has a number of fields um, in the etcd. The first and most important is the idea of an index. And this is a monotonically increasing version number, um, and it's shared across the entire key space. So every time you make a modification of the key space, the, the version number increases, and each key has the uh, version number of the last time it was modified. Um, and then the key itself, obviously, and then the value of the key. Um, so uh, in this example, we have a, <clears throat> uh, a scheduler, uh, like the cluster scheduler that we had talked about earlier. Um, and this scheduler is master electing itself. Um, and the reason you want to have a leader election on a, a scheduler is because you only want one entity within the cluster to be making decisions. Uh, as, as much as like, uh, as much as we like to think about organizations as being meritocracies, a lot of times it's just easier if you leader elect one person to make the final decision on everything, um, particularly in computing systems. So in this case, uh, the machine three, which is the value field, has taken the leader key, which is scheduler, and it started uh, taking that key at version 18 of the key store, and it has an expiration time of September 18th at two o'clock. Okay, so this process, which is the yellow square, um, is talking to this three-member etcd cluster, the blue and two red nodes, the blue node being the master, uh, or the leader of the, of the etcd cluster. <clears throat> and it's writing in and updating uh, with a compare and swap. All right, update the TTL on this thing from index 18 um, and register me as the thing. And then again, uh, before the TTL times out, it'll do this compare and swap again. It's saying, I know that the current index is 30. I want to uh, reassert myself as the leader. Um, so update this key again with a new TTL um, at, for machine three. So this again increments the version number. Um, and then at some point, that the, the machine or the VM or whatever that was running the scheduler uh, exits, um, power failure, disk failure, CPU failure, etc. Um, and now we rely on this expiration countdown um, <clears throat> to finally delete the key. So etcd is making internal sync calls, then uh, the key gets deleted and removed from etcd. At this point, um, other machines who are uh, available to be the, the scheduling process, they're able to come in <coughs> and make a, a leader election decision. Um, and so what they do is they do a create. And a create only succeeds if that key doesn't exist yet. And that key no longer exists because the um, <coughs> because it was deleted through etcd. So this, this other scheduler on machine five uh, says, all right, create me as the leader. <coughs> And uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take care of all the tasks of being the scheduler for this cluster moving forward. All right, so the, um, the basics of etcd as far as how it operates, uh, you have this leader and, um, leader and follower architecture. 
Uh, and when you first bring up an etcd cluster, everyone is a candidate. Um, so the internal algorithm for etcd is called Raft, and you can think of it as uh, democracy as a as a um, algorithm. And so everyone is a candidate, and then everyone puts out proposals, hey, vote for me. And then uh, once somebody gets a majority of the uh, people voting for them, uh, they become the new leader. Um, and we have a service called discovery.etcdio that allows you to easily bootstrap these machines because you have this problem of I have five or seven machines and I may not know the IP addresses of these machines beforehand. Imagine that I'm using AWS or something and I want this cluster to come up automatically. Uh, I don't know the IPs of those machines when I start. Um, when I when I talk to the AWS API, so we give you this token, um, well, six EA, um, and this token uh, is a URL that you place into etcd and say, hey, as the etcd machines come up, register yourself here, and then you'll use that metadata um, as uh, the initial bootstrapping. So this five machine cluster, say, spun up on AWS. Um, each of the etcd members registers themselves to the discovery service. Um, they get all this information, and then once they've hit, say, uh, five machines, um, in this case, they will, uh, they'll do their initial leader election. <clears throat> and then you get a fully bootstrapped uh, server. And the discovery service really isn't anything special. It's just another etcd cluster with a little bit of magic in front of it. Um, so the discovery service is using etcd so that when um, inevitably AWS nukes one of our discovery machines, uh, the service remains available. <laughs> And then uh, while I was making this diagram, one of the things that I thought of uh, after I made it was flying security monster. Um, anyway, guys, um, so everything in etcd goes through this uh, write-ahead log. Um, and so each of these is a log entry, uh, similar to, it's a, essentially a, a modification on a key. Um, and these are the indexes. And so uh, etcd has a few properties of being a sequentially consistent um, store. And so when you modify a single key with an etcd, every member of the cluster sees that modification in the same order as the, the leader who accepted the right. Um, so you never see uh, dog and then cat. You always see cat and then dog um, with an etcd. Uh, and one of the important things to remember is that etcd isn't, uh, hasn't defeated physics. Um, we're no faster than the speed of light, unfortunately. I'll let you know. I think that's coming in 3.0 of etcd. Um, so uh, you have to always think of things in etcd as a, a uh, behaving in, in a system where there's always latency. And so um, you could imagine that you've written at 10 o'clock the, the state that um, one of the keys is set to dog. Um, but you read from another, another member, and it still says cat. Um, this is a problem. Uh, but if you always rely on the version numbers instead of real time, um, you'll always get the correct answer because at version two of the data store, it's always going to be dog, no matter what happens. Um, so what you can do is you can actually, um, you can wait. Uh, you can make a blocking request saying, I'll, don't give me the result of this uh, key until, until the key store is at version two. Um, so it'll block on that request and then return dog once the request, once that member of the cluster has gotten that state. Um, and then you can do interesting things like uh, do quorum gets so that you always get the most up-to-date uh, value based on the quorum of the cluster. Um, so in this case, uh, even if that one member is out of date, it doesn't have that second log entry, a quorum get from that member will always return dog because it'll force it to ask a, a simple majority of the cluster for the answer before returning to you as the user. Um, and then the other property is that you can do these HTTP long pulls um, to uh, wait until changes happen in the key store, which is really nice for um, essentially doing I notify things, but in a distributed system. <clears throat> All right, but one of the, the things to be aware of is that everything has an end, and um, the event history at some point will be truncated within etcd uh, because uh, we can't store history forever. Disks aren't. Uh, unlimited memories and unlimited, etc. So you have to design for that sort of failure. 
And then the last bit is uh, etcd is designed for machine failure, as we talked about. So uh, in this five-member cluster, if we lose a single um, follower, that's fine. Uh, if we lose a second follower, that's fine. But you should probably be paging somebody because you're about to have a bad time. Um, and once you lose a third member of the cluster, uh, etcd is no longer available for writes. Uh, it can optionally be available for reads, but you're na not able to make changes to the key store. <clears throat> Uh, and it's also tolerant to leaders um, having hardware failures or being turned off. Um, <clears throat> however, it will be temporarily unavailable. So uh, if this one member goes away, that's fine. Um, if the leader goes away, then the cluster halts until it's able to do a new master election, which is typically very fast and usually under a second, depending on how um, your network and dis disks are configured. Uh, but um, after the temporary, temporary unavailability, the um, cluster will make a new decision and um, elect somebody, and then they'll, they'll, the cluster will be available again. <clears throat> um, yeah, we've made a number of mistakes. Uh, <laughs> you always make mistakes when building software. And so uh, some of the things that we fixed in etcd2, which is our upcoming release, um, is adding uh, checksumming uh, to protect against disks um, having problems. <clears throat> Uh, we found that uh, a lot of people accidentally misconfigure software. Who knew that people would accidentally misconfigure software? Um, and so we've added a bunch of protections to ensure that misconfigurations are much less fatal. Um, essentially putting a UUID on everything, um, every, member, every piece of metadata within the cluster. And uh, we've also found that um, <clears throat> uh, doing an F-sync on cloud uh, on cloud disks is extremely slow, and we've had to um, handle and document um, all the cases where that's uh, like the case. All right, um, the final thing is a plug that I have a bunch of other talks uh, coming up at LCA. I have an introduction talk on Wednesday. Um, I'm doing a couple meetups, and then I have a tutorial on Friday. All right, um, so I want to thank you. I want to say that we like pull requests, and that the project can be found at github.com slash coreos slash etcd. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to take questions. I also have way more slides, but um, I'll leave it there. So. so we have a break now until quarter past. If you want to ask some questions while there's a break, go for it. I was wondering how you might compare etcd to some other distributed key value systems like Samba's CTDB. Is it... Um, are you aware of CDDB or you know um, how it compares? Um, so the the primary thing is that etcd is a consensus backed uh, key value system, and the primary use case is for doing things where um, you need to have a consistent view of the data at all times. Um, so uh, the sorts of applications where if um, if you ever had inconsistent data, you'd be unhappy. So the DNS, load balancers, scheduling decisions, these sorts of things, lo using them as, as locks for reboots. Um, and so the only other systems that have these properties are things like Zookeeper um, and then another project called Console. Um, uh, the Zookeeper has a number of problems, uh, primarily the no runtime reconfiguration. and. Um, and the consensus protocol has, uh, hasn't really been that well proven uh, from the computer science standpoint, whereas the Raft protocol that we use has uh, got a lot of um, literature behind it at this point. Um, if you end up with a network partition yep. and two masters when the network comes back together, is there any automated way of handling that or is it up to you? Uh, so, yeah, you, in the face of a network partition, um, uh, imagine that you have a five member cluster. If there's uh, the weak side of the partition has two members, uh, those members will continue, will not operate. And the strong side of the partition, uh, they'll do a master election and continue operating. Um, there's no, play, there's no uh, way to do a split, blank, split, split brain within etcd because we require everything to go through a simple majority of the cluster. Um, so it's always the strong side wins. Um, and then if you have a, a in ways a network partition, then you're kind of out of luck and the system remains unavailable until the network partition resolves. Is the auto discovery documented such that I can run my own auto discovery instance? Yeah, so 
Auto Discovery essentially just uses a, a second uh, etcd key store, and we provide documentation um, if you want to run your own uh, for Discovery. It's mostly a convenience. Um, you can also do a manual bootstrap where you provide the IPs on the command line, um, but the, the cluster bootstrap, we felt like it was a high enough barrier for most people that we wanted to provide a public service just to make it easy. It's completely optional. Nothing actually references etcd.io internally um, in the code base. A trivial question about locksmith. Uh -huh. Can you increase the size of the semaphore at runtime? Yeah, so there's a command line tool called locksmith CTL that allows, uh, gives you the ability to list out the machines that are currently holding locks and then um, allows you to bump or un force unlock uh, the semaphore. Thanks. Uh, hi. Is it always five uh, instances? Like it can be anything um, that you'd like. You run a single member on your laptop. Uh, I usually run five on my laptop just for testing of the internal communication. But generally, you want an odd number um, so that you're actually uh, getting an additional fault tolerance. Because if you have an even number, you, it's always three out of four need to vote. Um, and it should be generally it's it's like five to nine is the safe thing. Uh, the reason that Google uses five, for example, in their in their Chubby system is because that allows for one planned outage and one unplanned outage, and then allows for the cluster to remain available. Um, people do choose like seven. I think it's kind of not necessarily to go much higher than five, but. Um, for example, the Discovery cluster has been running on five. And um, today, we got our first outage in almost six months. Um, and so it's, it's been fine. What was the The outage was caused by, uh, it actually was a, uh, um, only a read site outage. And it was caused by a bug in our rate limiting proxy so that we don't get abused by public users. Um, so we were still, etcd was running fine, everything was fine. It was a single VM failure. Um, it was just an unfortunate side effect of how the discovery etcd IO proxy was written, um, which is like a 500 line Go program. And so it had nothing to do with etcd, it was the rate limiting software in front of etcd. I suck at coding, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I think 